This is Antoine Arnault, his years are 1612 to 1694, and he was a fairly no well-known theologian and philosopher in Descartes' day. And I remember when Descartes wrote his meditations on first philosophy, he first circulated the manuscript to a bunch of different intellectuals to get their objections. And then he wrote replies to those objections, and when he first published the meditations on first philosophy, it came along with six sets of objections and replies. And he later added a seventh. Um, but the fourth of the objections was written by Antoine Arnault when he was just a student of theology. And I think he comes up with a brilliant uh, objection. Now, the objection turns on this point, that it's one thing to know an essential feature of something, a feature without which it can't exist, it's another thing to know all the essential features of that thing. And just because you want know uh, one essential feature, it doesn't follow that that's all there is to its essence. It doesn't follow that that's the only essential feature. So the point here is basically this. Maybe it is essential to me that I think, or if we make the corrections suggested last time, maybe it's essential to me that I'm able to think. But I can't conclude from that that that's the only feature that's essential to me. How can I rule out that it's essential to me that I am extended? Suppose that I just am a brain, then maybe it's essential to me that I'm able to think, but it's also essential to me that I take up space. So Descartes says that I, I know that I'm a thinking thing, um, but how can he conclude that that's all there is that's essential to me? Now. Arnaud puts this in terms of a geometrical example. So let's go through that. Arnaud says, consider a triangle that's inscribed within a semicircle. And what's interesting about any such triangle is it, it's a right triangle, that that angle right there is going to be 90 degrees. And you may remember a theorem that applies to all right angles. It's called the Pythagorean Theorem. Named after the ancient philosopher Pythagoras. The Pythagorean Theorem says that um, for any right triangle, if you consider, if you take the, the length of the hypotenuse, that's the side of the triangle that's across from the right angle, and you square it, that's going to be the same value as uh, taking the value of each side, squaring it, and adding them together. So for any right triangle, this formula is going to hold. a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And uh, here is one essential property of any right triangle. Call it property 1, having a 90 degree angle. And here's another uh, property, call it property 2, being such that the Pythagorean theorem applies to it. So there are two properties which are essential to any right triangle that there is. A right, there couldn't be a right triangle with, which didn't have both of those properties. A right triangle couldn't exist without having both of those properties, right? Okay, now suppose we're dealing with somebody who's not a smart guy like Arnaud. Consider a dumb guy like, I don't know, your cousin Eddie. And uh, maybe Eddie uh, understands right triangles only a little bit. And he does understand that any right triangle must have a 90 degree angle. Um, but he doesn't understand that any right triangle must have this second property. He's like, what? I never heard of this Pythagorean theorem. Now, Eddie would be making a giant mistake to, to say, well, I understand that the first property is essential to this right triangle. And so, therefore, that's all that's essential to the right triangle. No, he can't conclude that at all. Or if he's dumb enough, he might even deny that this property 
applies. Um, here's an even simpler geometrical example that really makes the same point. Um, here's two properties of any triangle whatever. Um, one is being trilateral, that is having three sides, and one is that it's triangular, it has three interior angles. And suppose he just is really dumb and barely knows what a triangle is and he says uh, yeah I, I agree that any triangle must have uh, three sides. This is an essential property of any triangle but I don't agree that any of them has to be uh, triangular. Like he's Incoherently he's imagining there could be a triangle that didn't have three interior angles. Okay so you can know one essential property of something and you can fail to realize that something else is also an essential property of it. So again, suppose Descartes knows that it's essential to me that I'm able to think. Um, how does he know that's all that's essential to me? It seems like he doesn't know that. It seems like he doesn't have grounds, that he can't rule out that uh, it's also essential to me that I'm extended, that I take up space. Now Descartes takes a crack at answering this in his reply to the fourth set of objections, but I have to tell you, I think he kicks up a cloud of dust and repeats himself a lot, but I don't think he really answers it. It ends up to be he just is insisting that he does not understand the entire essence of himself. Of course, that's the very pointed issue. So I don't think this argument is successful. So to recap, what's the objection? Let's go back to the argument. The objection would be that, uh, Arnaud's objection would be that we don't know premise two. And because that premise is not known, the argument isn't cogent. It's not known to be sound. It might be sound, but until we know that premise two is true, we don't know it's sound. So this argument should not convince us. And just to recap the, the previous objection that we don't always think, if that's right, then, then this premise is just false. And then the whole argument would be unsound. So the first objection is that it's unsound. The second objection is that, well, whether it's sound or not, it's not cogent. It's, it's not known to be sound. Okay, but Descartes has an extra argument. It's kind of a throwaway argument. Um, it seems to me that he just kind of slips this in very quickly. It's kind of a backup argument. And I call it the divisibility argument. I'll tell you why I have a wiener on there in a minute. Uh, premise one says any mind is partless and so is indivisible. You can't move its parts apart if it's if it's simple and not partless. Second premise, any body has parts and is, and so is divisible. So for any extended thing, it always has more than one part, so you can always separate its parts. And it follows by a valid argument that therefore no body is a mind and no mind is a body. If any mind is partless and any body has parts, there can't be a mind which is a body, there can't be a body which is a mind. That is, there can't be a thinking thing, a conscious thing, which is extended in space, and there can't be any extended thing which is a thinking thing. So it is a valid argument. Um, now, what's the argument, or what would he say uh, to back up each premise? This is important to ask, because it's valid, but what we really want to know is, is it sound or not? So what can he say in favor of premise one? He says, look, I can't detect any parts of myself. It's true I have different powers or different abilities, different faculties. I have the power to will. 
I have the power to think. I have the ability to feel pain, and the ability to have visual experiences. But um, those are just powers of the whole mind. Those aren't parts of me. So basically he's saying I seem to be something which is single and complete. I seem to be simple. I seem to be a thing with no parts which is simple and yet has many different abilities. So that's what he says in favor of one. The main point is that we're not aware of any parts of the self. Uh, now what does he say in support of premise two? Well, think about, again, back to geometry class, think about a line segment. And, uh, and you divide that line segment in half, and you divide that half in half, and you divide that half in half, and you divide that half in half, and that. And how long can you continue this process? Well, if you remember back to geometry, the answer is you can continue it forever. A uh, line is supposed to be infinitely divisible. So space, uh, if space has the structure of classical geometry, then uh, any portion of space is infinitely divisible. And Descartes is just assuming that objects which fill space are also infinitely divisible. So say you've got uh, one of those big hot dogs like they sell at the uh, state fair, foot-long wiener. And uh, you take the foot-long wiener and you cut it in half. And you take that half a wiener and you cut that in half. And you cut that in half. And you cut that in half. And, well, we can't keep illustrating this, but it turns out there isn't any smallest possible wiener. No matter how many times you cut it, there's always... Uh, another time that you can cut it. You can keep going infinitely and getting a smaller and smaller wiener and there won't be any smallest one. Maybe that's good news to some that there's no smallest possible wiener. Um, but in any case, um, that's what Descartes is assuming about physical objects. That for any physical object, whatever, whether it's your body, or your brain, or a hot dog, or uh, a very small part of your body, like a cell, any physical object, no matter how big or small, can be divided infinitely, he's assuming. So is this a sound argument? I don't think it is. I'll give two objections to it. Here's one. Um, but if the mind or the self had parts, why assume that we'd be aware of them? Do we really have good reason to agree with premise one? Because if we don't know premise one, then we don't know that the argument is sound, and so the whole argument will be not cogent, not known to be sound. I mean, look, the eye can't see its own color, though not without a mirror. Um, maybe we're aware of our existence and that we think. Maybe we're even aware that it's essential to us that we think. But if we were thinking things that had parts, why assume that we would just be directly aware of those parts? I don't know. Furthermore, premise two is false if there are physical simples, if there are fundamental particles, if there are um, physical parts, it turns out, that you can't divide into smaller parts then premise two will be false. And you might think there have to be some fundamental particles. So if we, and this may depend on what you think science has shown us or what physics has shown us, but if you think physics reveals that there are fundamental particles, then you should think that premise two is false. Uh, if you think nobody knows whether or not there are physical simples, well, then nobody knows whether or not premise two is true that all physical objects can be infinitely divided. And so again, the argument would not be cogent. So you can, you can challenge both of these premises. Uh, you can say, we, we don't really know that one is true. We don't really know that two is true. So this argument should not convince us. So I don't think either one of these arguments by Descartes really is convincing.